to start my presentation with giving you a very short case presentation that could be of help in describing this problem. The story is about a 71-year-old female who presented with nausea, fatigue, and diarrhea in the emergency department. She also described palpitations but denied other cardiovascular symptoms, and no neuromuscular symptoms were reported at that time. <coughs> she had a familiar history of hypercholesterolemia and esophageal reflux disease, and we was using omeprazole together with atorvastatin for some time. And also, she has been smoking for the last 45 years. When she came to the hospital, she was stressed, in acute stress, and her blood pressure was quite lowish. Her heart rate was rapid, 125, and she was tachypneic. But on physical examination, she showed no clinical signs uh, uh, of uh, uh, any major abnormalities except for signs of dehydration. These are her initial labs. And you can see the abnormalities are related to the serum creatinine in blood urea and uh, the low uh, semantic chromofiltration rate. Uh, otherwise, her lights were good together with the albumin, urine was unstriking, and the ECG at that time just showed the sinus tachycardia. The patient was admitted and the intravenous fluids were instituted. And after two hours, she improved, her blood pressure rose, she started to pass urine, everyone was very happy. But five hours after the admission, the patient became critically ill, she started to convulse, she developed cyanosis, and she even lost consciousness. They had uh, to start resuscitation again, and her ECG at that time showed the very serious torsal de point ventricular arrhythmia. They asked for a cardiological uh, consultation and immediately the cardiologist, the first thing he asked for was serum magnesium, which was initially forgotten. Her serum magnesium, as you can see, was markedly depressed, 0.7 mg per deciliter, and from the severe dehydration, she also developed a state of AKI. As a rule, and as a standardized medication nowadays, intravenous magnesium sulfate was given over 30 minutes, and her rhythm was converted back to sinus. Careful examination again could not detect any gastrointestinal or renal losses to explain the hypomagnesemia. Although her diarrhea that was present on admission could have contributed a little bit to the occurrence of hypomagnesemia. After 10 days she became better and she left hospital. Her AKI had resolved only by conservative measures and her sinus was, and her heart rate was sinus again. She was maintained on daily oral supplementation, and this was a very good idea, oral supplementation of magnesium. Unfortunately, after three months, she came back again to the hospital, this time complaining of muscle cramps. The doctor didn't forget this time to check the serum magnesium, and he found that the serum magnesium was again low, 0.8%. What was happening? After a thorough examination, it was concluded that the hypomagnesemia was simply a side effect of the PPI omeprazole. She had been taking the PPI for the previous 13 months. We now know that the PPI are strongly related to CKD and acute interstitial nephritis, and there's a big warning about the prolonged use of these medications. Add to this list, please, hypomagnesemia as well. Her PPI treatment was stopped, and after six months of follow-up, her serum magnesium was normal and everything was okay. Hypomagnesema does develop mainly after chronic PPI ingestion, generally over years, and occurs, like this lady, more frequently in elderly women. Looking at the literature, you can find an explanation for this uh, correlation, where PPI impaired the intestinal magnesium absorption through various molecular mechanisms related to genetic and pharmacological uh, things. So take care of the PPIs. Why is it forgotten? Like everything in the body, we need magnesium to be in a homeostasis. Too much of it is bad, too little of it also is bad, just like potassium, just like blood sugar, like many things. Just to give you an idea, we are ingesting around 360 milligrams of magnesium daily in the diet, if we are taking an adequate diet, 
mainly present in green leaves. Bananas is a very good source of magnesium, by the way. Uh, losses in the feces is around 120 milligrams, uh, 260 milligrams, and most of the filtered uh, magnesium in the urine is reabsorbed. It is stored mainly in the bone, uh, around 13 uh, grams of magnesium exists in the skeleton and about 6 grams uh, in the muscles. And you can see up there to the left hand side the normal serum values in milligrams or millimoles if you wish. What's happening in the kidney, a very peculiar way of reabsorption, which is quite different from various solutes such as glucose, sodium, potassium, and whatever the kidney is reabsorbing. Here, magnesium is. 70% reabsorbed in the thick ascending uh, uh, limb of the loop of Henley and it also follows calcium and when there is a depletion of magnesium or calcium there is uh, uh, a depression of the real, uh, of uh, a more I mean absorption of uh, magnesium from the distal convoluted uh, tubule. Magnesium you have to realize it is the fourth most abundant cation in the body and the second most abundant intracellular, and we are still forgetting it. It plays various important physiological roles, like you can see in the right hand side, involved in blood pressure, cardiac functions, even depression. It could lead to depression, muscle cramps, and many, many other things, and arrhythmias, just like the case I showed you. And in contrast to these important roles, yet magnesium is often underestimated. Visiting intracellularly uh, magnesium to see uh, another point of interest as nephrologists, we may be interested in this. We do know that phosphorus is related to vascular calcification and leads to osteochondrotic transformation of the smooth muscles of uh, the blood vessels. Now, uh, phosphorus does this by inhibiting the protective action of matrix blood protein which is related to vitamin K and the bone morphogenic protein 7. This action is aborted by the presence of magnesium, so this is an added value for magnesium. Not only this, it is capable of binding to the calcium sensing receptor and as such it could also ameliorate the vascular calcification that's going on in our CTD patients. So this is a very important point. It's forgotten because disorders of magnesium are hardly mentioned in the most of the educational uh, books of medicine. Serum magnesium concentrations are not measured routinely. What I had, I had, the only to be used regularly. Most magnesium abnormalities, as such, are remaining undetected. And why is this happening? Because the clinical signs of both hyper and hyper are so non-specific and may look alike. Hypomagnesemia can be caused by a wide variety of range of diseases as you can see listed here. Losses from the kidney, uh, GIT tract or in certain climate disorders and it can also be a side effect of several drugs. It can be asymptomatic and the rate of development of hypomagnesemia overlay had the zoor symptoms. The faster it is, the more you will be able <coughs> Excuse me, to appreciate symptoms. These are just some of the symptoms and not all of them, nausea, vomiting and so forth, numbness, tingling. There's a lot of things can produce such symptoms. For why? I'm not going to think about magnesium except if I have it on my mind. The cardiologists are far better than the nephrologists. They have it so clear, magnesium there has this a long time. They made the ARIC trial, uh, which was a uh, very strong power trial, 13,000, and they could really find that the lowest serum magnesium levels were correlated to the chronic heart disease, and the case uh, uh, explains just this notion. So don't forget the drugs, the PPIs, the metformin, I didn't have time to present something about it, and definitely diuretics are also wasting magnesium. Magnesium for us nephrologists is strongly related to both vascular calcification and osteoporosis and looking to this graph you will find as the creatine clearance drops, the fractional excretion of magnesium also drops to maintain the serum magnesium almost to near uh, normal levels and sometimes in a state of hypermagnesemia. Looking at this very interesting uh, 
uh, observation uh, comparing diabetic patients with non-diabetic subjects, you would find, uh, looking at the upper uh, graph, that uh, as the creatine clearance drops, you will find that the serum magnesium starts uh, to rise over here, while this is not the case in diabetes. There are some disturbances in the co-transporters of magnesium in the gut in diabetic patients, which could also be per perpetuated by the use of metformin, which causes some diarrhea. That's why this is not happening in diabetics. So, creatine clearance drops, magnesium could rise. In dialysis, mostly in this country, we are using the concentration, the first one, which is the 0.5 milligram, uh, 0.5 millimole concentration in the bath. There are other concentrations. You can see the 0.75 and uh, the 1 uh, millimole. This is a very interesting uh, work that is changing our uh, old views about dialysis bath and the lower concentrations of magnesium that we are using. This author or these authors had two calls for patients. The first one was subjected to dialysis. If I can just move the cursor here, yes. These, this cohort was dialyzed with a 0.5 millimole magnesium, while the other one was using the 0.75. It's clearly, ev clearly evident that the patients that were dialyzed by the 0.75 did much better in relation to uh, survival. And looking at both graphs uh, below, this same finding reflects on all cause mortality and cardiovascular morbidities and mortalities as well. So, pushing the magnesium to 0.75 with a modest increase which would result in the serum magnesium does not offer harm, but yet it offers benefit regarding all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. Serum magnesium is associated with vascular calcification in PD patients as much as it is from these three publications that I put. Uh, also, this is happening in hemodialysis patient, and there is implementation that dietary magnesium supplementation is important as seen in this publication in last November for Kidney International. This could be of help. And in blood purification, serum magnesium and mortality in mental cellulars has been documented. The lower the magnesium, the higher the risk of mortality. So, lower serum magnesium is a risk, a risk factor for cardiovascular mortality in men in the cellulars patient. As such, magnesium seems to be a new player in CKD, and I will always reinforce the notion too much is bad, too little also is very bad. To take you a little bit intracellularly in order to understand and appreciate the role of magnesium, you can see here what it's doing. Magnesium is preventing or inhibiting the endothelial dysfunction by blocking uh, uh, to expression and thus it inhibits vascular calcification. This is one pathway. It also prevents the formation of the hydroxyapatite, which is bone, leading to ossification of the blood vessels and reduces the calcification propensity. Not only this, it is a wonderful phosphate binder and it helps in reducing the dietary phosphate and the phosphate is directly related to the vascular vascular calcification story. So giving magnesium also, like a combination of calcium and magnesium, would help in this regard. Coming to the bone, it has a major effect in the integrity of bones, and it's also related to the parathyroid and the hyperparathyroidism, which I will show in the coming few slides. So you can understand and realize how crucial magnesium is in the algorithm of vascular calcification. Looking at the bones, this is to show you the various segments and constituents of bones. You find the majority of the bones formed of calcium phosphate, yes, and magnesium does not share all that much. Yet this too, uh, this small amount of magnesium, small as it is, it is very crucial for the integrity of the bones. And in experimental work, it was found in the mice uh, that had uh, hypomagnesemia, their bones were brittle and fragile and developing 
micro fractures. Later on, in human experiments, I didn't want to put them here, did show the same results. The strong relationship between magnesium and PTH could be explained in this slide. Uh, I just mentioned that it has the capacity of stimulating the calcium sense in a receptor, yet it's not as strong and powerful as calcium, yet it, dis it does bind with the calcium sense in the receptor and occasionally other sites as well. So the calcium sense in receptor is something very important in order to have an effect of magnesium on the parathyroid where it is able in suppressing the PTH levels just as much as calcium is doing. This is a recent publication from a journal called the Parathyroid Disease that clearly shows that low serum magnesium CKD is linked to mortality, they are the hyperphosphatemia. Lower plasma magnesium vessels are directly related to the cardiovascular calcification and uh, my group at the Lazar five years ago, four years ago, we showed this in one of the theses and we were supplementing patients with uh, magnesium to see a positive uh, endpoint on retardation of the vascular calcification. Hypermagnesium does reduce the parathyroid secretion, which is a risk factor for vascular calcification. Also, it has a beneficial effect on reducing nephrotic hypertrophy, which is leading to increased mortality in hemodialysis patients. Numerous investigations detected that patients having higher serum magnesium tend to have lower PTH level. And this is something good. And some of these studies may have methodical limitations in reality, but this is what uh, the major finding is. Now I came across this very recent trial from Japan with a very strong power. They work over uh, 113,000 patients. Matei Mubere did them. Uh, what they simply did, they divided their patients into patients receiving low magnesium bath dialysis and a little bit higher and the higher form to see which patient is going to do best. Uh, astonishingly, the total of patients that received the high magnesium level did the best in, re, in reference to the occurrence of fractions. So this is a very new point to consider. And I would be afraid to elevate the serum magnesium for fear of complication. You can see as long as it is above normal, above normal which is 2.2, but a little bit less than 4, this is all right, and no, nothing is happening. But it's better for the bone because it's deposited in the bone and preserving the bone. This first uh, landmark trial, which has a very strong power, really is a very strong message to this particular point about magnesium in relation to bone. Can we use it as a therapy? It has been used as a therapy since a very long time for this, for this list of things. Hypertension, even it, it's good for diabetes, it's good for the chronic, as you've seen from the case presentation, prevents arrhythmias, eclampsia, of course, we all know. But can we use it for our patients? The combination between magnesium and calcium salts was non inferior at all to severely merit hydrochloride in controlling serum phosphate in hemodialysis patients. And I think this is a cheaper way of controlling hyperphosphatemia and getting an added benefit of magnesium towards hyperphosphatemia and towards the bone and uh, decreasing the risk of fractures. When I went and had a look at the k Doki, which is released just a few months ago, there was nothing mentioned about magnesium. Of course, uh, K-Doki, when they started to write it maybe a few years back, no much literature was present at that time, but mark my words, the next k Eagle will have it as a guideline to put magnesium. Uh, looking at the publication, this is just one of many, denoting that cation, this cation is neglected, forgotten, as I say, and magnesium supplementation could help reduce serum phosphorus concentration, PTH, and definitely interfere with the occurrence of calcification and the defects related to bone uh, mineralization. This is a fantastic big trial which is really of a strong power and we should all be eager and waiting for the results. When I did my modest trial, I could not get significant results in relation to vascular calcification to short, just two years, but there were non-significant changes. The intima, the carotid intima, Entima was less thick. Anyway, we have to wait for the results of the MagiCal trial in prevention or ameliorating vascular calcification. 
In conclusion, hypomagnesium in the general population is overlooked, should be considered, and uh, may be caused by the drugs I mentioned, PPIs, metformin, and diarrhea. Watch out for patients who have chronic diarrhea, please. They usually have hypomagnesemia. Strong relation exists between hypomagnesemia and vascular calcification, osteoporosis, and fractures, and supplementation have been shown to ameliorate these complications. Never forget that too little is bad, too much of it also is bad, but how much is enough is still a question to be answered. Maybe the CalMAC trial is going to answer this question, and I'm very happy I finished before my time, and I thank you all for your kind attention.